Welcome to this Wednesday webinar from ESU 8. I'm Katie Morrow, and for my first Wednesday webinar of the 2018-19 school year, I'm thrilled to bring to you some accessibility tips to help you use your technology devices to make learning more accessible for all. All. That includes yourself, as well as the students and other fellow learners that you work with and around. Now, we know that accessibility isn't always just for those with verified handicaps. Um, two cases in point, sidewalks and the slanted curbs that allow for wheelchair access are also extremely handy for those of us on bicycles, skateboards, or pushing strollers. Closed captioning, built originally for those who have hearing problems, works super well when you are in an airport terminal or any noisy place where you want to be able to hear what's being shown on the screen. So we know that using the built-in accessibility features that Apple devices come equipped with is a great way to help us all learn more and better. And sometimes we don't even know that they're there or are able to take advantage of them. So I hope to highlight some that uh, maybe you aren't using, but you or your learners could benefit from really easily. I'm going to split this Wednesday webinar into three sections, starting with iOS accessibility settings, followed by how to do the same or similar things on your Mac, and finally, when creating instructional materials for your students or for other people, um, what accessibility considerations should you keep in mind? A recommended tip that I have for you while watching this Wednesday webinar is to feel free to hit that pause button and practice each tip in between. That way it'll make it more accessible for you later on. We'll begin by exploring the accessibility settings that are built into my iPad. Note, I will be displaying iOS 12. However, most everything should be very similar in iOS 11 or with older operating systems. Just be sure to research it ahead of time if your screen doesn't match perfectly. We're going to take a look at three different ways to make your iPad or your iOS device talk to you. All three are located in settings, general, and then accessibility. We're gonna start with a feature called voiceover. Now this is built for those who are blind. So when you turn it on, it will read everything on your screen. Voiceover on, landscape, home button to the left, settings, voiceover, voiceover, on. Notice in order to double actually tap, to tap toggle something, setting. you have to double tap now. Voice over off. Because a single tap is in essence telling it to read whatever you're tapping on. You can, however, change the speaking rate, the speech voice that's used in voiceover, and some additional settings if this is a feature that would benefit the learner. Returning back into the accessibility section, we notice that there's also speak selection and speak screen. And I find that these are even more beneficial for a wide variety of students using their iPad as a learning device. These are found underneath of speech and we have speak selection and speak screen. They will probably be turned off by default, but I recommend turning them both on so that you can use them whenever you want to use them. Speak Selection does just that. You select text and it speaks it to you. Speak Screen speaks the whole screen to you on whatever web page or page of text that you're currently on. You get that enabled by swiping down from the top of your screen with two fingers. So I can show both of these to you by visiting a website in Safari and trying out Speak Selection and Speak Screen now that I have them enabled in my settings. So remember, in order to use Speak Selection, you just need to select some text on your screen. Then in the pop-up commands, in the heads-up display, you'll just go ahead and tap that Speak. Powerful assistive features are built into iPad to complement your vision, hearing, motor. Now I can turn that speed down as well, or I can just let it read to me as fast as I would like it to in order to have that verbal reinforcement of what I'm reading on the screen. For the Speak screen, I use two fingers and pull down from the middle of my screen. Apple, Mac, iPad, iPhone, watch, TV, music, support, accessibility, Here Mac, I have a iPad, toolbar. iPhone, watch, TV. 
Hold Notice on. That Stories it is built for the things you do every day. In every way, you experience them. Powerful assistive features but are built also, to complement your vision, hearing, motor skills, learning, and literacy. So you can create, it learn, It gives work, me a menu work, so that I can slow it down. Work. I can pause it. I can skip to the end and we'll go forward or backward. Featured, vision, hearing, physical and motor skills, minimize, learning and li And I can close that speak screen command bar. So those are two great tools to use anytime you want a portion of your screen read to you or the entire screen read to you, as long as you turn them on in its settings first. I think it would be a safe bet to say that many, many people have troubles with vision other than being blind. And so let's take a look at what else is available for us in the iPad accessibility settings for vision. Go to general, accessibility, and in that vision section, another item we can turn on is zoom. When we turn this on, we get basically a screen magnifier, and we can see that if we double tap with three fingers, we enable that. And we can then utilize the little handle on the bottom to get that section of the screen to zoom. We can read the controls here and how to utilize them with our fingers. It's three fingers, a double tap to turn on, dragging to move it around, and double tapping with the three fingers and dragging at the same time on the same gesture to change the amount of zoom. So this lets us read what's on our screen in a larger print using a little bit of a magnifying tool. Back in accessibility, we also have the magnifier. Now this is actually using the iPad camera to magnify something on the outside of your iPad. So if you have small text in a book, you can turn that magnifier on, and now it tells me that I'm going to triple click the home button in order to start the magnifier. So when I triple click that home button, it becomes a magnifying glass that I can adjust what I'm seeing on the outside. This is a book and use the zoom controls to basically function as a magnifying glass. How great is that? You can take screenshots as well if you would like. Um, there's a, a button here that would allow you to capture something. Um, but they don't save to camera roll. So if you truly want to save a picture of something that you have magnified, um, just do a traditional screenshot. And finally, another one I'd like to highlight in the vision section is the display accommodations. Here's where you can quickly and easily invert the colors of your screen. There's a smart invert and a classic invert based on what kind of settings work best for your vision. Probably better turn that back. There we go. Um, color filters for color blindness, um, depending on, again, what kind of an accommodation works best for your eyes and your vision. You can change that within the iPad, iPad settings as well. We can also see here that larger text sizes can be used on the iPad in order to zoom all of the text on your screen to be larger print. We can make bold text. However, we'll need to restart our iPad to get that to take effect. We can make the buttons have shapes around them to be more easily identifiable with sight. You can reduce the transparency so that blurs on the backgrounds increase legibility on what you're supposed to be focusing on. You can increase contrast and reduce motion. And finally, on-off labels allows you to see different things on the buttons to know if they are on or off. And also, if you'd like to turn off the auto brightness so that it doesn't automatically dim on you and always stays bright, you can do so here. Um, however, that will affect your battery life and so if you do like it to automatically dim, you can leave that on. So some additional display accommodations for your iPad to help you see better what's on the screen and off the screen. Let's take a look at what's available to help us with our touch when interacting with the iPad. If we go to Settings, General, and Accessibility, and then swipe down to the Interaction section, we can see that here, are some controls to be able to adapt to our touch needs. The one that I really want to highlight for um, educational purposes is this assistive touch. Now actually what this does is it gives you an additional button, you can see it here, that you can customize 
And whenever you're in any app, you tap it in order to hit some of those commands or controls that you want to have access to. Um, you can put whatever you want in there or, or various items in there. And this is actually helpful for, for anyone, even if um, touch is not an issue. Sometimes when your iPad has a case on it, it's covering up the home button, for example. And so by using this assistive touch, you can put a button to your home inside of that assistive touch. Also, you may new notice that I've been using it as a pointer so that when I'm recording my screen, as I am now, I can just grab that little assistive touch button and drag it anywhere on my screen. And it's projected when I'm projecting my iPad so that people can see where my finger is touching. And so that's a great accommodation to keep in mind, as well as these other um, interaction features, including being able to change the home button and how slow or fast you press it and what happens when you interact with shake to undo, for example. If you have shaky hands and you don't want that feature on, you can turn that off and some other controls. In the hearing section of accessibility, you can see how we can turn on an LED flash to alert us or change our audio to mono or adjust the volume between left and right channels. Hearing aid compatibility is growing stronger and stronger with every version of iOS. But what I really wanna help you use better in your classroom are subtitles and captioning. So if you go into this section, and then turn those on whenever they're available on videos or images, those subtitles, those captions will show up. I'm a firm believer that even if we don't have a hearing issue, that this is beneficial for any learner as they learn to match printed text with what they're hearing. Um, not to mention the noise level in a classroom that can benefit from that. Watch what can be done in the iOS in order to support multiple languages. Scroll past the accessibility settings in general. Go down to your keyboard settings. You can add additional keyboards to match most any language. We can add a Japanese keyboard. And these keyboards will appear in the order that we have them selected here inside of our keyboards menu. You can also change the language of your entire iPad, language and region. Right now it's set to English, but we could change that and the region where the English is coming from as well as those different languages in the preferred order that we'd like them in, and the dictionary. So now just to test out our additional keyboards, let's pull up a note, and our regular keyboard is, is showing right now, but down in the bottom left-hand corner is the languages to switch between the different keyboards. So we'll see here, this is what the Japanese keyboard looks like, a second ago, we would have seen the emoji keyboard and of course the Spanish keyboard with certain characters there. Let's visit Safari, navigate to CNN.com and click on a link to read an article. On many sites, there's distracting advertisements and a lot of graphics that don't have anything to do with the text of the article. And you can see that that is indeed the case here. However, on many websites, they're enabled with reader, reader view, and you can tell that by looking for these horizontal lines in the, the left side of the URL address bar. To get reader view enabled, just tap on that, and it instantly strips it of anything that would be distracting as far as that additional media and advertisements. Um, additionally, inside of reader view, you can easily change the font, the font size, invert the colors, and do all kinds of ways to make this even more accessible to any reader. This is, works great for printing. And a final note, if you always want your websites that have reader view, enable, reader view enabled to open up in reader view, do a long press. And you can say use on all websites, an automatic reader view for Safari. While we're using Safari Reader, let me also highlight a great powerful tool on the iPad that is using split view or multitasking. Um, to do this, just pull up your, your dock from the bottom middle of your screen and do a long press on the second app that you want to share the screen with. So I have my article in Safari and then I'll tap and hold on my notes app. And when I hold on to it, I can pull it out of my dock and then join it on the side of the, of the screen. I can go on the left or the right and I get um, a split screen view 
that I can interact with both the, the article on Safari as well as my place to take notes. Um, both sides of my screen are completely scrollable. So if I want to select some text on the left side, I can tap and hold and drag it into the right side, as well as the same thing with pictures, images. And um, I could easily build a sheet of notes while not having to navigate in and out of apps quite so much. To get rid of this Safari or this split view that works with most any apps on the iPad, um, we'll just drag that split view back off to the right and that second app will disappear. So again, pull up from the bottom middle, do a long press on whichever app you would like and then drag it up. If you just let go of it, it'll float on top of your um, whatever's running there. And if you want it to dock, you can just attach the top middle to the top of your screen and then adjust your two views as you wish. Did you know that you can save any web page as a PDF? Just visit a web page, use the share arrow, and in the bottom panel, find create PDF. It instantly opens up and in the top right hand corner you have the markup tools so that when you're on that PDF you can highlight text, annotate it, and then when you hit done decide to save it or do whatever you want with that annotated PDF. The final feature for iOS that I want to highlight is again an accessibility feature um, in general and then accessibility and way down towards the bottom called guided access. This has been available for a while on the iPad and it's something that you could take advantage of for small groups of students working on the iPad, helps um, as a behavior tool, a powerful tool for students with autism or attention and sensory challenges. To enable it, just turn it on in settings here and now it tells us to triple click the home button as our signal to get it started. So I'm going to use Book Creator as my example app. We're going to have the students work in this word collector journal, but I want to turn on my guided access so that they don't get off task while doing so. I'll triple click the home button, and this gives me my settings for guided access. Down in the bottom left hand corner are the options. These are the uh, controls that I would want the students to be able to use or not use. So they can't control the volume. They, they, I could um, impose a time limit if I wanted to for them to use the app. Um, motion keyboards touch and sleep and wake button and I'll just leave those as is. I can also circle or draw on areas of the screen that I'd like to disable. So if I don't want students to accidentally go back to the My Books library in the Book um, Creator app, I'll just kind of black it out here with this tool and now they won't be able to um, touch anything underneath of that colored highlight. I'll hit start and it asks for a passcode that only I will know so that when the student is finished and we want to take it out of guided access mode, I'll have to put that same passcode back into the iPad. So now my students can use anything on the app. If they try to hit the home button here, it will not go home. It tells them that guided access is enabled. Um, they don't know the passcode, so triple clicking it won't get them anywhere. And if they try to tap on my books up here in the top left corner to accidentally exit this book, they also will not be able to. It won't go anywhere. It just lets them navigate the pages and do everything else within the app, but not the places that I don't want them to go. Um, when they bring the iPad back to me, I'll triple click that home button. I'll put in that same passcode and it'll take them out of guided access with the end command. It's as easy as that. It's a great tool for the classroom. Let's try and take a quick tour of some of the features on Mac OS. Some are similar and some are different, but I'll show you how to access them. Starting with system preferences on your Mac. Here's the system preferences panel in my Mac. Most everything can be found inside of accessibility. Down here in the bottom right hand corner with the blue icon. Starting with general, you'll see the accessibility shortcuts listed there. VoiceOver for vision is available on the Mac. The zoom settings. Display, inverting the colors and all those vision accommodations. As well as speech, the different speaking voices available. 
and there is a hotkey that can be set up similar to speak selection on the iPad that you can use to speak selected text on your Mac. There's media descriptions and captioning that you can turn on and change the way that they look for closed captioned videos. There's a flash screen alert for those with hearing problems. You can enable in dictation so that system-wide people can use their voice to control and command the typing on the screen as well as Siri and you can type to Siri as well. Keyboard accessibility features, mouse and trackpad, and then of course those who aren't able to use the mouse and the trackpad but can control their computer with switch controls. So quite a bit in the accessibility settings on the Mac. You can turn on speech accommodations in the system preferences accessibility features, but I just wanted to highlight how they work inside of the Pages app as well. When we're working in pages on a word processing document, all we need to do is go to the edit menu and then pull down to speech. We can start speaking any oh, text. A power line was hit by lightning. The power line was snapped in half and it looked like it was just hit by an We can stop it the same way. And, and yes, that is a computerized voice, but it's still great for students to hear back their own writing that way. Um, likewise, we can add additional text using dictation just right within the app as well. Edit and then start dictation and now whatever we type will be typed on the screen for us. I'm not going to do that now but it's built in right inside of the the Mac um, iWork apps so that's good to know as well. Safari Reader is helpful on the Mac as well as the iPad. Just visit a web page in Safari that has Reader enabled. Look for those little lines in the left-hand side of the URL and click them, and you now have your cleaned up text-based web page. It still has the AA feature on the right side of the URL bar, so you can change the size of the text, the color of the text, and the font. And we can still do that click and hold to always use Safari Reader automatically on either just this website and all of its subsequent pages or always whenever it's available. Remember it won't always have those those reader view enabled it depends on the website but sites that are primarily text-based it'll really help um, make them a lot more accessible for all learners. Let's have a little more fun learning with Safari on our Mac. First of all did you know that you can hit command plus and instantly zoom the text on your screen. Command plus, command plus, command plus makes that font just a little bit bigger each time and command minus 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 will shrink it back down. Next let's get our screen into split view like we did on the iPad. To do that on the Mac go up to the top left hand corner of your Safari window click and hold on the green expand arrows. When you let up you'll have your Safari window on the left and the right side of your screen waiting for whatever other open app you want to put in that second half of your screen. Let's find a note that we can use to take some notes just like we did on the iPad and here it is. Both parts of our screen are independently scrollable so that we can read and then transfer into our notes. We can also adjust that divider bar and give more space to one of the two windows and we can drag and drop images from one into the other just like we did on the iPad. So it makes it a great um, tool to make learning more accessible. To get out of this um, you can try to click those green buttons again or I just like to hit escape more than once to get back to normal. All windows are back to normal now. So far in this video I've been focusing on how to make learning more accessible as a learner. But for this next section, I would like to focus on as a teacher. When you create instructional materials, what should you keep in mind? What practices should you employ so that on the end result, every learner can gain knowledge from your resource? I'll be completely honest. Closed captioning every video you make is near impossible. It takes a ton of time. There is professional software like Final Cut Pro that will allow you to do it or third-party applications like Movie Captioner. But these aren't realistic for every educator. However, I do have two free and relatively easy ideas to try to get your instructional videos closed captioned.
Did you know that videos on YouTube may enable closed captioning just automatically as long as you turn it on? Here's a video I uploaded to my YouTube channel. And in the bottom of the uh, window here for the video, I can turn on the closed captions or the subtitles. These are not going to be perfect because they're YouTube generated, but they took zero effort on my part. I'm Meg Schlunz, sophomore right side hitter, and this season is going to be on for because we're great team chemistry. I would argue that at the bare minimum doing that makes a video more accessible and encourage our students to do so as well. That is if the video is on YouTube. Apple's free clips app is easy to create live captions that are fairly accurate as long as you're connected to Wi-Fi. Here I'll open up the clips app and I've already started a new project and I'm ready to film something. I can do that with the camera or I can go to library and find an image and pinch it and place it. The trick to doing the closed captioning is to turn on live titles. Down in the bottom left you'll see the speech bubble icon. This gives you the, st the style of live titles and to make them look like closed captionings we'll just choose one that places them across the bottom of the screen. Now we just record. So as I talk and narrate my video, it will automatically caption or attempt to caption what I'm saying. Don't worry if it makes some errors because we can go back and edit those at the end. I'll give it a shot here. I'll press and hold that red record button and start recording my voice. Let's tap on that clip we just recorded in the bottom left and go to the live titles speech bubble. And now we can edit any of the text, including adding end punctuation, moving words around, or doing any additional edits, and then whatever we, we leave in there will be on the screen in our final video when we export it to our camera roll. This student opened up an image that he took and then changed the opacity of the image to about 50%. Then using the drawing tools, he was able to trace on top and draw a self-portrait. Image descriptions, or alt text, are important so that those with visual impairments can have a screen reader read aloud to them what content they should be seeing. Here's how to turn on alt text in Twitter. First visit your Twitter homepage, then in the top right click on your Twitter account settings, go down to settings and privacy. Now on the far left scroll all the way to the bottom, click on accessibility. Make sure that the checkbox is checked for image descriptions to enable you to compose image descriptions for any tweet that you post. Now go home and the next time that you load an image onto Twitter, you'll be able to add that description and have the screen reader say whatever you think should be said. In this case, back of child's head looking at a television screen. And apply. When you post it, that image description will be built into the image. This content more accessible as well. Here I am in a Canvas course. I'm going to add a page to a module. And when I edit that page now and load up an image from the right hand sidebar, I can upload an image from my computer. We'll use that same one of the child with the back of his head looking at the TV screen. And it automatically actually requires me to type in some alt text before I actually post it onto the page. That's good. Um, unless it's a decorative image, then I could just check the box. Now I can hit upload, and now I can use it on my page once it's been loaded into my Canvas images with that alt text already built in. Um, additionally, once you've created the content on your page, um, you can test it for accessibility based on um, Canvas's standards. It's this little icon on the top of the, the menu bar above my page, my page editor, and it has the little accessibility icon. If you click that, it will give you a check and an all clear if everything is good to go. And if there are some issues detected, you can fix those before actually publishing the page. That can help you keep your content more accessible to all learners. You can add alt text image descriptors in the iWork apps on your Mac as well. Um, whenever you add an image then to a document, this happens to be in pages, just visit the inspector and click on the image tab underneath the formatting inspector and that image description box is available there.
If you have a document or a handout to send to your students, I would recommend it exporting as an EPUB if you're able to. Here's an example of a piece of student writing that was built in Pages. And if this is exported as an EPUB under File, Export to EPUB, it gives the reader more control over how they're able to read it. Um, we can put in some settings if we want, as well as choosing a book cover and decide where we're going to save this EPUB. We'll put it on our desktop so that we can directly open it up off of our desktop. It'll open up in iBooks because I'm on the Mac or the iBooks app on the iPad as well or anything that can read an EPUB. And now, like I said, it just looks like a finished published book, but the reader has control over the text size, the font, and those um, features that definitely make it more accessible. In addition, because it's an EPUB, the student or the reader can select text, add highlights and notes, and definitely interact with it at a higher level than if it was just a PDF. Did you find something that you can use? Is there something that will help make learning more accessible to you or to your students? I surely hope so. Keep on learning with ESU 8.